great pleasure to have Dr. John Wright with us this afternoon to answer the questions of our colleagues. Okay, thank you, John, and, and welcome to our live conversation here. In, uh, we are in Brazil, you are in Dallas, Texas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Um, your talk was very nice and you addressed the new controversies uh, about odontogenic tumors. I, I would like to make a question for you about the variants of central odontogenic fibroma, because you presented that we had two um, variants and maybe we could keep only one, but we uh, saw some different variants as amyloid variant uh, reaching longer, uh, longer hand cells rich uh, granular cells. So what, you ask, what is your experience about these variants of central odontogenic fibroma? Pablo, very good question. And it, my answer in my lecture probably was not clear. The 2005 WHO divided odontogenic fibroma up into two major variants. And that was the epithelial rich and the epithelial poor one. The epithelial poor one is the one that many of us have called the simple type and many other people call the epithelial rich one, the WHO type. And I think the simple one has always been controversial. Uh, in my opinion, it's not epithelial poor. It doesn't have any epithelium in it at all. And without any epithelium, it's hard to prove it's even odontogenic, but it's clearly not desmoplastic fibroma. And so our seven member panel decided to eliminate the simple variant of central odontogenic fibroma. As you pointed out, and I did not mean to imply, there are two other variants that are well recognized. One is the amyloid rich variant that has gone by two names in our literature. I was taught that was a variant of a pinboard tumor, and that's what we called it for a number of years. I believe there's sufficient evidence today that that should be grouped under adonogenic fibroma, and it is a variant, and it does exist, and it was acknowledged in the 2017 WHO. The granular cell adonogenic tumor, I think most people have correctly put under a variant of central adonogenic fibroma. And I didn't mean to imply that those are gone now. They are variants of adonogenic fibroma. So we probably have a histologic spectrum that really has three different lesions that we call central adonogenic fibroma. Okay, thank you. We received um, another questions from the audience. So I'm going to read it for you, okay? First question. Excellent lecture, Professor Wright. Uh, do you believe that ameloblastic fibrodentinoma and fibrodontoma might be present as a separate entity in a future who classification? I do. And again, they were both entities in the 2005 edition. They were only eliminated as entities in the 2017 edition. And as I pointed out in my talk, that turned out to be more controversial than I think many of us anticipated. Uh, it was the consensus of the working group that once amyloblastic fibromas start to produce any hard tissue, and they have to produce dentin before they produce enamel, so you're gonna have amyloblastic fibrodentinoma first, and then odontoma as it produces enamel. I really do believe that most of those lesions are then committed to differentiation and maturation and will become odontomas. Uh, even in the 2017 classification, we had a couple sentences to the effect that there may be isolated lesions that are dentinomas or odontomas that are neoplastic and would probably remain at that stage, but because that's the exception, not the rule, and I think the classification should be based not on the exceptions, but on the common and most general way things present, we decided to eliminate it. But again, that was controversial. And in 10 years, if we have seven different people, they may very well put them back into our classification. 
but, but what, what was your criteria to eliminate then? Um, for example, if you see a, um, a meloblastic fibroma with one third of odontoma or less than this, you're going to call it as odontoma. It's not about the amount of hard tissue in the lesion. What was the criteria? Even after the publication in 2017, I personally sign AFOs out as ameloblastic fibroodontoma, parentheses, developing odontoma, close parentheses. Uh, people are used to the term AFO. It doesn't need to go away. We can still use it. But I do believe most of those lesions are developing odontomas. Uh, we've got a huge biopsy service in the United States. And to the best of my knowledge, the last time I checked, it's been a few years, we have never had an ameloblastic fibroodontoma recur. Uh, I do know there are some in the literature that have. I do know some of them get large. Um, but I do believe that most of them, once they start to mature, they will become odontomas. Right. We, we saw a case, I think two years ago, uh, that we diagnosed as um, a dontogenic fibrosarcoma in a boy with 10 years old in the posterior mandible. And he, it was a challenging case for us as well because we thought it could be a, a, a meloblastic fibroma, an aggressive or a fibrosarcoma. And we, sign it out as um, uh, a meloblastic fibrosarcoma. Great. Pablo, there's one other thing. I get surely the audience is familiar with the paper that I think Amos and Marilena wrote on the mixed adonogenic tumors and that maturational sequence. There are numerous examples of ameloblastic fibroodontomas that when they recur are considerably more mature odontomas which right. have documented that maturational sequence. Okay, another question. Uh, I don't have the names of the colleagues that made that, that question, so I'm reading it. Uh, you mentioned the need of an excisional biopsy for the final diagnosis of unicystic ameloblastomas. How important are serial sections in this scenario? just recommended or indispensable? Well, to some extent, I think they're indispensable. And again, we train our residents that when we gross these cysts, we need to be looking grossly for anything that looks like a growth or something different to make sure that we take sections out of those areas. Uh, I don't think there are any objective criteria as to how many sections we should be taking through these cysts but I do think we have to liberally sample them to be relatively confident that there's not a mural invasive part of that tumor somewhere. Okay, another question. Uh, could you tell us as a summary, which entities might change again in the next edition of who classification? Well, that's a really easy one. I think all of the things we did that I disagreed with will be changed. <laughs> Again, I shared with you, I would not have made malignant or metastasizing ameloblastoma benign. Yep. I really think we made a mistake. And I think the opportunity will be there for us to be able to show that those are different at the molecular level and I fully anticipate that being moved back into the malignant category. Uh, I still think the sclerosing adonogenic carcinoma needs to be better defined with diagnostic criteria before it was included in the classification. So that lesion with another 10 or 15 years may or may not stay in the classification. For the past few years, we have been studying uncommon presentations of AOT, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor, and we were able to collect a large sample in which patients tended to present enlarged 
tumors with average of 3.4 centimeters. Based on these large presentations, I would like to know your opinion regarding the nature of AOT, whether it is an anomalous developmental amartomatous growth or a true benign neoplasm. Well, I think conventional wisdom, we most of us have classified this in the category of hamartoma rather than neoplasm. And that's been fairly consistent over the years because once again, I don't think we should define our entities by the exceptions, but by how most of them behave. And most AOTs are small, they enucleate, they almost never recur, and hence most of us view them as hamartomas. I do think that there are some diagnostic pitfalls in that there can be more aggressive lesions that are diagnosed as AOT, but incorrectly. Uh, very frequently, ameloblastomas will have the stroma drop out and become cystic. And those ameloblasts that surrounded that stromal core look just like the rosettes or ducts of AOT. And I've seen those called AOT by pathologist on consultation, when in my opinion, they're not AOTs, they're ameloblastomas, and they do look distinctly adenoid. So I think you have to first be very careful that in fact, your diagnosis is correct. Uh, I personally have a couple huge AOTs in my collection that I do believe the diagnosis is correct. But again, when dealing with biology, we're dealing with that bell curve and these huge lesions really are outside the standard deviation. And I think we need to define these entities by the norm, not the exceptions. But there are some big ones, but there's also the chance that these were misdiagnosed. Do you think adenoid ameloblastoma with dentinoid has enough evidence to be considered a separate entity in the, next, in the next who classification? I do. It was actually acknowledged in this classification under ameloblastoma. And whether it's an entity onto itself or just a variant of ameloblastoma, but clearly you can argue if it's got dentinoid in it, it ought to be a mixed tumor. Um, I think to make that diagnosis, you need to make the distinction today between adenogenic carcinoma with dentinoid that didn't exist or it wasn't recognized before 2014. And so some of them may be that lesion, but to the extent if the dentin really is an integral part of the tumor, it should be a mixed tumor. And it, that may be one that justifies, again, with further evidence and documentation, being placed as a standalone in the classification. There is another question about uh, adenoid ameloblastoma. Okay. How often do you see uh, adenoid ameloblastoma in your uh, routine? Um, I, I said to you that we saw a very uh, uh, nice case that there was an area of AOT and the rest of the lesion was an ameloblastoma and we call it is an um, adenoid ameloblastoma that was located in posterior maxilla. Um, so how, how often do you see uh, these cases? Because I think in my personal opinion, uh, of course, uh, that we have to report more cases uh, we have to learn more about adenoid ameloblastomas. What is your opinion? Yeah, I totally agree with that, Pablo. And again, part of this is the extent to which we see it. I think we can have microscopic foci of little adenoid structures in many ameloblastomas, but they wouldn't be there to the extent that any of us would think of misdiagnosing that as something else. Uh, we have seen some ameloblastomas that were predominantly adenoid. And those are the diagnostic challenges. And those, in my opinion, are quite rare. But this is another area that's open for further investigation. There's got to be a molecular reason why they differentiate along those lines and why they look like that. And again, I think with further investigation, we'll have a better handle on how those are different and whether they behave differently. OK. 
Thanks for the very nice talk, Dr. Wright. Do you consider that cemental ossifying fibromas are a truly separate pathological entity from ossifying fibromas affecting lung bones? Well, I do. And the primary reason is we do believe the cemental ossifying fibromas are of periodontal ligament origin. I only have very limited experience with long bone lesions that colleagues have shared with me that they want to call ossifying fibroma. And in all fairness, I guess they are fibrosis and you have to call them something, so they want to call them ossifying fibroma. But I believe they are distinctly different. I believe our cemento ossifying fibroma is different than the two juvenile variants that we see in the craniofacial bones, the somomatoid variant and the trabecular variant. I do not think those are adonogenic origin. That's why they occur in bones other than the jaws. Uh, we took some heat calling that cemento ossifying fibroma. Everyone in our audience knows that the only definition there is of cementum is the hard tissue opposed to the roots of teeth. And should we call a matrix cementum if it's not on the roots of teeth? And I accept that criticism but we chose to call it cemento ossifying fibroma for this version of the classification because it implies the adonogenic origin. And we do think they're a PDL origin and there is some evidence for that. And I think they're different from long bone lesions and from the other craniofacial ossifying fibromas. Another question. Could you share your view regarding marsupialization of unicystic ameloblastoma and the meaning of the results of this procedure on the understanding of the neoplastic nature of this lesion? I am personally against it. Uh, there's actually some fairly decent literature, much of it came out of Japan, of decompressing unicystic ameloblastomas. But remember in the first part of my lecture today, I do not believe you can make the diagnosis of unicystic ameloblastoma on an incisional biopsy. Well, you have to do the incisional biopsy to know that's what you're dealing with. And your pathologist says this is unicystic ameloblastoma and you decompress it for a year. You have no idea what's going on in the rest of that lesion. And if there's a mural component with infiltration and invasion into the wall and then into the bone. And I think you take great risk that if you try to decompress one of these in some other part of the lesion, there's infiltrating tumor and that would have an adverse effect on the patient. So personally, we do not recommend that despite the fact that there's been some success stories in the literature. We have had through our service several large recurrent ameloblastomas after an attempt had been made to decompress a cystic lesion. So I just think the risks are too big and we don't routinely recommend that. Yeah, we don't recommend that in our service as well. Um, we have to give um, um, our, we have, uh, Another question here from Roman Carlos. Thanks, John, for a great lecture. In my opinion, the diagnosis of a developing odontoma versus a meloblastic fibrodontoma largely depends on location and mainly age of the patient. Completely agree. Uh, I think that was one of the primary points that Marilena and Amos pointed out in their paper, and there is correlation with that. Uh, and I would agree with Ramon. And once again, Ramon's got the kind of reputation. He could have easily been part of the working group. And if he was there instead of me, they might not have taken it out. But very insightful question. I've got, I've got a question from Liam Robson from South Africa. Dear Professor Wright, I would like to know your opinion on keratoameloblastoma. Does it exist? Yes, we do make that diagnosis. That doesn't necessarily mean it exists. Uh, it is acknowledged in most of the classifications. It's quite rare. 
I think there's some diagnostic overlap between keratoamyeloblastoma and what has been called solid OKC. And there's some very subtle differences in my opinion, but both of those entities probably exist. And we do make the diagnosis of keratoamyeloblastoma. It is in the literature. Um, I think that the audience probably ought to be aware one of my biggest criticisms of the WHO classification is its brevity. And we're really limited on page allocation. And those write-ups are so short. We don't have the option of talking a lot about variation and controversy. Uh, the WHO serves to me primarily to identify which lesions we recognize and which we don't. I think that the AFIP fascicles on these diseases were really intended to more illustrate the spectrum and to focus more on the diagnosis. And the new AFIP fascicle is in the works right now. I'm actually fortunate to be one of the editors on that. I'm writing the endogenic cyst and tumors for the fascicle. And a lot of these rare things that this audience is asking, Pablo, are dealt with in some detail in the fascicle. Whereas in the WHO classification, many of these things aren't even mentioned. Great, thank you. Yes, I think it's a, <clears throat> a good announcement that IFIP fascicle will be published soon. And I think we, we will learn a lot with these new illustrations on odontogenic tumors. We are supposed to be finished in late fall. And so we think sometime next year, I think the fascicle is written a lot more on a level for a practicing oral pathologist than the WHO classification, which I pointed out earlier is really the primary audience are the hundreds of thousands of general pathologists. We are really not the primary audience for that publication. I've got another question from Liam regarding the rare variant described by Pindborg and Altini as a papilliferous ameloblastoma. Do you think this is a variant of keratoameloblastoma, papilliferous ameloblastoma? I think there is some histologic overlap. Uh, again, we have one of the largest biopsy services in our country. We have an opportunity to see an awful lot of material through our lab. And I've only made the diagnosis of papillivirus amyloblastoma one time. Uh, many of you are probably aware that there is a distinct tendency for the peripheral extraosseous lesions to become quite papillary as they react with the surface epithelium. But we're, you're talking about intrabony lesions. And they're, they are documented in our literature. They really are quite rare. It's a diagnosis that's difficult to make that does have some histologic overlap with other tumors. Um, Roman Carlos complemented his previous question. Would you call a developing odontoma in a 28-year-old patient in which odontogenesis is supposed to be seized? Yeah, I know we all teach that, Roman. <laughs> Uh, it would probably depend upon the size. I know that the older they are, the larger they are, and those are the ones that in fact are probably neoplastic, and I agree with that. Uh, it would depend on a number of things as to what I would call that, but Ramon makes a very, very good point about that. Um, I've got a question from Mario Romanashi from Rio. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Could you comment about a possible odontogenic origin of central giant cell lesion, just like some cemental ossifying fibroma? Well, I think the neoplastic cell and cemental ossifying fibroma is essentially a fibroblast. That's why we call them fibromas. And we speculate that they do come from stem cells and periodontal ligament. Uh, the giant cell lesions, those giant cells are not adonogenic. 
I've heard people talk about them coming from PDL, but ultimately they come from our bone marrow. And so I don't really think the giant cell granulomas are adonogenic. Uh, I always, I've, I've thought for years, the peripheral ones, I think probably come from periosteum. Uh, they're limited to sites that are overlying bone. We don't get them on cheek or tongue or labial mucosa. Uh, but anyway, uh, I do know that some people have speculated their periodontal ligament origin, but even if they did were derived from that, they ultimately came from bone marrow. Um, Bruno Maris. Could you further comment about neuroinvasion being an important feature in the diagnosis? but rather controversial in causing odontogenic carcinoma. Yes, and I alluded to that, and there was one point I meant to make in my talk that I forgot. So thank you for the question. I'll be able to make that now. Uh, the only justification for calling that malignant was muscle invasion in those huge tumors that came out of bone and infiltrated soft tissue but I would argue in most of our practices, we get the lesions biopsy before they ever come out of bone. So we're not gonna find muscle invasion. So the only diagnostic feature, as far as I'm concerned, is perineural invasion. And we don't get that in all tumors and in 100% of the sections that we look at. We sometimes get little fragments of curated material out. And I think the likelihood of finding it, even if it's there, is remote. So it bothers me that that's the only criterion we had. The other point I wanted to make during my talk that I forgot is adonogenic epithelium is remarkably neurotropic. We talk about the organ of Shevitz, all oropathologists know about that. Roy Ebersol had some good papers on how rests of adonogenic epithelium can be found in nerves, in bone biopsies for other lesions, just as coincidental findings. So, I'm not convinced that even finding epithelium in nerves makes that malignant. And this is another reason why I thought perhaps putting this in the classification at this point was a little premature. I still have enough reservations about what this lesion is, how we diagnose it and how it behaves that I thought we probably should have given it one more cycle to decide what to do with that lesion. Could you comment about angiomatous component in some ameloblastomas that biologic seems more aggressive? Yeah, I think that's more historical. Uh, I had the pleasure and honor of training with Bill Schaefer, one of the world's top oral pathologists. And he had several of those that they actually called hemangioameloblastomas. And there was serious consideration to making that a variant. Uh, I believe most of that has been pretty well discredited. A lot of those are operated previously and you don't know how much of that angiogenesis is just repair following surgery. Uh, I'm not convinced that it really is a histologic variant that is biologically different, but it is something we see from time to time and clearly it is in our literature. I've got two questions from Paul Spate, Sheffield, right? If unicystic ameloblastoma can resolve after decompression, is it a neoplasm? <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I saw your kind note earlier. I was supposed to see you last month and that didn't work. And now we're both in Brazil and I still can't see you. Uh, my answer would be no. And I'm one of the ones who argued with keratocyst. If a significant number of those lesions completely regress with decompression, we should not be calling them neoplasms. And number one, Paul, if there's mural involvement and you decompress them for a year, those are gonna come back as infiltrative traditional ameloblastomas. If it truly is 
luminal only, I can see how those lesions could significantly shrink, but I do not think they would be definitively cured. And I think it could take 15 to 20 years for ultimately that lesion to recur. I have an N of one of a cystic lesion that was called unicystic ameloblastoma that was decompressed almost to the point you couldn't see it. And about seven or eight years later, it did recur as ameloblastoma. Again, N of one, anecdotal. Uh, but this is an area that I think is ripe for further documentation and we need more evidence in this area about the biology of these lesions. Another question from Paul. How about a unifying concept of unicystic ameloblastoma and calcifying odontogenic cyst being variants of the same entity, the ameloblastomatous odontogenic cyst? Well, to me, they're histologically distinct. They're distinct at the molecular level. Um, I don't think we frequently see lesions that have features of both. Uh, they certainly share some biologic features, but many benign things share those, and yet they're different. So I, I guess I never thought about that, but I don't really see a lot of reason to try to group those together. I think their biology is quite distinct. Their histologic features are unique, and I think they're unique lesions. But then again, I'm not writing the definitive textbook on a Donna Jake cyst. <laughs> For sure. Our friend, our friend Professor Spake's doing that. Uh, Paul made an observation now. Ed wrote a very nice paper on epithelial in nerves, pointing out that it was quite commonly seen in endotogenic epithelium and other situations. Absolutely, that's what I just said. Ray Eversaw had a paper and he's not the only one, but we can see it in bone, we can see it in soft tissue. Uh, we found that on several occasions through our service of soft tissue biopsies done in the retrobolar pad, that you'll find a little nerve running through there with a single little piece of epithelium in it. We don't call those organoshevets, but I think it's the phenomenon that we're talking about. So again, that's a real pitfall. If that's gonna be our only diagnostic feature for sclerosing adonogenic carcinoma, is that really sufficient? Uh, I have another question for you. What is your experience when you are um, um, dealing with aggressive ameloblastomas? Uh, do you... Uh, use key 67 to differentiate uh, uh, meloblastic carcinoma from a typical ameloblastoma. What is your experience with, with this uh, kind of cases? Yeah, and this is an area that's ripe for further investigation also. Number one, ameloblastoma period is aggressive. I mean, they are very locally aggressive neoplasms. But histologically, there's that gray area that we call them atypical, and then past that area, we call them malignant. Uh, one of the problems is uh, CHI-67 for most ameloblastomas, it's less than 5%. When you look at things that people have called malignant, it ranges anywhere from about eight and a half percent up into the 60, 70% range. Clearly, if any of us had a lesion that had 40 to 50%, we're gonna call it malignant. Uh, I would have trouble calling something out and out malignant if CHI-67 was 10%. Uh, I've always had a problem with looking at the cells through a microscope and estimating what percent are affected. Uh, we typically don't tend to use software to do that, although we should. 
it would certainly objectify those readings a lot more. Uh, I think one of the most useful markers today is SOX2. I think that's some work that Brad Neville did a couple of years ago. Uh, and we had a case last week through our service that we were going to call a typical ameloblastoma. So the CHI-67 came back at about 30% and the SOX2 had strong nuclear reactivity in every tumor cell. So we're leaning toward calling that malignant. But I think this is an area that needs further defined and needs to evolve to more accurately claim. Classify these normal amyloblastoma in Chi 67. Sorry, I'm back. Um, okay, I, I think we can uh, uh, finish our talk, but I, Manuela told me to make some announcements. First one, that we have to wish a happy anniversary uh, for Alan Roger. Alan Roger is a, a friend close and he's celebrating his anniversary today. So ha happy anniversary for Alan. And that we are going to have a very interesting talk this evening with Professor Elena and Andrea Caroli. The, she's going to show her, her experience with cell block and infra bone lesions. And we are going to have um, a, a prize at the end of the Cesar Miglorat meeting and talk um, last Friday, and the next Friday, okay? so just to give these uh, messages to our colleagues, okay? Uh, John, I have to say a big thank you once again for you. It's always a pleasure to have you here in, in, and receive your knowledge. And so we hope to see you again next year in Brazil in person. Thank you very much. You can say your yeah. words it, to conclude our meeting. It wasn't as much fun if I had been there. Uh, again, it was a real honor 